Um, yeah, Joe and I uh, have been friends for a long time, and um, this has been something that has been on our radar for a while. And we thought we'd start a very short project, just doing a little bit of mapping, and it turned into uh, quite an extensive project and um, became more and more interesting the more we looked into it. So we're going to take you through some of um, the rationale behind. Joe, can you change the slide, please? So we're going to take you through some of the rationale between why uh, we started looking at digital open science tools um, and then uh, how we started realizing there were key restrictions um, embedded in the design of these different um, what we call DOSs. Uh, that were impacting on their ability to not only be open as tools themselves, but also um, impact on their ability to, um, to create an open ecosystem uh, for open science to flourish online. Uh, we're then going to talk about uh, some of the key uh, objectives of the project, so mapping the DOS landscape and, um, and identifying some of the key findings, and then linking it back in the last couple of slides to um, looking at how these design limitations in DOS uh, undermine the idea of the unlimited digital commons that has become a kind of tagline when discussing uh, the open science landscape. And then we're going to go open it up for questions and hopefully there'll be quite a lot to talk about. And um, just as a matter of interest, I do realize that my accent is perhaps not as comfortable as, as some for many people. So please, if I'm speaking too fast or my accent is unclear, um, just raise it in the chat and slow me down because when I get excited, I do tend to speak uh, quite fast. Um, okay, so the next slide, please, Joe. Great. So just as a, um, a touching base to make sure everyone's on the same uh, on the same page, and I'm sure this is uh, taking calls to Newcastle, as we say, um, what is open science? So open science is really understood as a collection of activities, principles, tool, and tools oriented at making scientific research accessible to all levels of society um, to increase the transparency and efficiency in research workflows and scholarly publishing. And we'll all recognize that open science is really an umbrella term that covers a whole lot of different areas of activity. Um, they have very different communities and very different um, objectives and areas of act action. And these include open access publications, um, open data and, and <laughs> fair data sharing, um, the huge uh, community around fast free and open source software. And then some of the other things that are perhaps a little newer like open peer review, open methodologies, uh, open hardware and so forth. Now, Joe, now, do it. Oh. Um, okay, so what we were really interested in is that these different communities um, have started uh, driving the creation of a range of digital open science tools, so the DOS. And these digital infrastructures and tools and online working practices um, are starting to underpin uh, open research activities online. And in this way, the digital open science tools are becoming a ubiquitous part of open science. So it's difficult to think about being open and doing open science if we're not engaging with some of these uh, digital tools. And these online tools assist researchers in sharing and collaborating. And this way, they're really driving the underlying objective of open science to increase the openness and transparencies at all stages of the research life cycle. And many of these tools have changed the way research is done and how research resources such as data sets, publications, educational tools and software are circulated globally and are increasing the access to um, these open resources. But what's happened is um, that what we're very concerned about is that these tools are being uh, developed by a range of different people for a range of different reasons and integrated into the involving landscape without what we feel is a necessary critical evaluation on um, how this landscape is evolving. So, Joe? So as I said before, um, we're talking about digital open science tools today. And what we do is take a deliberately broad view of digital open science tools. And we define it as any digital tool that's for-profit, non-profit or community-led that's used in open research, irrespective of whether they were designed explicitly for open science or have been co-opted into open science practices. 
And this type of thinking is really evolved from a number of other great studies on, um, on digital tools that have been done, particularly the 101 innovations uh, that was uh, um, conducted a few years ago, one of the diagrams from which is uh, seen on the right hand side of your screen. And what they were trying to do was to map how um, scholarly public publication, uh, so, sorry, scholarly publishing was evolving uh, in light of these digital tools and mapping how the information was tracking through these digital tools in the different phases of research through discovery, analysis, writing, publication, outreach and assessment. So we took this as the basis for our, um, our study and started to think how these tools and other tools that are enabled uh, code sharing, data sharing and so forth um, were allowing information to move through the open science landscape. And whether there were a lot of questions that we needed to start ask around asking, needed to start asking around um, the underlying values that were being incorporated into the design of these tools, uh, what financial models they were using, what language choices they were using, and what geographical locations were um, uh, that they were associated with. So when we started unpicking this, um, it became very apparent that uh, DOS are highly variable in the way that they are designed in the communities that are designing them and the way that they are deployed. And this links to a whole range of different issues. Um, the structure of the organizations managing the development and rollout could be commercial, it could be an NGO, it could be community led, it could be institutional, or it could be a, a project funded academic um, activity. The funding for these um, for the DOS development and deployment could be through grants, through subscriptions, through commercial company investments, um, and through volunteers. The geographic of locations um, not only varied in terms of where the DOS was registered, but also where the funding organizations were located. Uh, the language of activities varied. Um, the way that the DOS recruited user communities could either be through bottom-up community endorsement, it could be through advertising, it could be through integration with other DOS, also through commercial endorsement. Uh, the scope of the DOS varied. It could be very disciplinarily specific, or it could be quite generic and be used by a number of different uh, uh, disciplinary communities. The purpose that the DOS were um, developed for could be very pra pragmatic. Um, it could be um, addressing a specific challenge um, that researchers had identified. It could be very idealistic, trying to change the way research was done, or it could be user need uh, driven, and therefore responding to comments and, and um, requirements from communities. And that there were also a number of different power dynamics uh, in play in the way these dots were being deployed. Um, there could be high profile user communities that were really championing, championing the use of these dots. Funders could be advocating for these DOS to be used, and governments could be endorsing them in the way that they were envisioning uh, their own uh, national research profiles. Thanks, Joe. So this um, recognition of these highly variable aspects of the different DOS um, let us ask a number of key questions of the DOS landscape. Um, we wanted to particularly ask, what the impact of a small number of countries dominating DOS designs and deployment, and what impact that had on the open science landscape, and what heterogeneities and values funding and stakeholders that influenced DOS design and uh, interconnection affected the openness of the DOS ecosystem, and how, if at all, the external power dynamics linked to funders and um, governments, and the influ these influences, um, how they were recognized, and if they were at all addressed in the DOS ecosystem. So Joe, do you want to take over from here? Uh, sure. So this is basically now looking at what Lou present, like, yeah, presented to you um, as an overview. So looking at the data set, so let me open the actual spreadsheet where we compiled our data because we're working remotely as a team from different places in the world, but not too far from each other, but yeah. so. Um, these online tools help a lot. So we're utilizing DOS services as we dive into their um, feasibilities. 
Um, and questions that we asked, as you've also seen in the first figure, um, de deriving from the 101 innovations um, scheme was like, what workflow step is the tool addressing? So here on the label, you find the companies, the initiatives, grassroots initiatives and, um, and companies, NGOs. Um, the labels basically that, um, and communities that um, now provide services that are being more or less heavily used by certain communities. Um, then the workflow step they address, um, range also relying back on the one-on-one -on -one innovations project. So analysis, assessment, discovery, outreach, publication, um, and so on and so forth. Then which open science category or principle um, the tool uh, complies with or um, basically yeah, can be categorized under like open data, open access, open science, in general, so this is when it's unspecific or covering all principles of open science. Um, yeah, open source software or not so much hardware because we're looking at digital tools. Um, then, yeah, the next category would be who is the host? And you see there's um, publishers often behind many of these tools. We, we, we've probably all heard of cases where grassroots initiatives got bought by a corporate publisher and then an uproar might have occurred in the community <laughs> or also github was at some point adopted by microsoft um, which which kind of had a yeah um an earthquake through the community and a realigning of um, value systems in the community um yeah and then there's also self-hosted instances and um yeah pro for-profit and non-profit organizations providing certain services. Um, we have a total list um, that we assessed of 242 digital tools. Okay, that's just for the scope. So as I'm randomly scrolling through the document to give you orientation. Um, Sarah, maybe you can also share again this, I'm not sure, not all we can, do we want to share it at this point? Or we, yeah, we wanted to discuss with you how to best make this accessible and to continue working on this, but let's keep us for the discussion. Um, so yes, it's, it's, like at some point very soon, you will also have access to the spreadsheet. Um, uh, so there's a question about what um, other infrastructure is the tool relying on? In many instances, that would be GitHub, which um, poses certain challenges, which we will also um, dive into in the discussion. Um, of course, the website um, description, if, if yeah, well, um, for most of them, um, the location, which poses also challenges and thresholds. Languages, as Louise mentioned, um, funding sources, very important for sustainability plans and um, capabilities. Who, if funding sources exist, then who is funding and supporting the tool? Um, in the past and currently, um, what kind of entity is it? Again, like grassroots versus um, corporate versus whatever. Well, not whatever, but I think we have like three or four. Um, categories here. Um, is there a fee? Most are free to use or there is a paid additional features or APC or yeah, other fee models um, that exist or have been invented for certain tools purposes. The terms and conditions which are often unread <laughs> but highly um, important to consider and um, for a special regional context but not only you might you will also want to read the terms and conditions if you have funder requirements that would um, by their nature exclude you from the user base of some of these tools um, <clears throat> also by the nature of your project if you have sensitive data or not you, you don't want to share that data with us based service providers or on a user based service because then you're basically already infringing with um, uh, data security. Well, what is the GDP? Oh, sorry, what? Uh, somebody help me. GDPR. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, so yeah, you see. So then let's let's finish the list of things re relevant passage from. So yeah, yeah. So basically, what was that? Um, relevant 
uh, part from the terms and conditions information about prohibition access of some of these tools, if applicable. Um, is there, an, do you have to sign up at minimum with your email address or like a next step would then be like, if, on, if not only the email address, what other data does the tool collect and why? Um, so there's also data scraping and reselling in the scholarly industry these days, as you may or may not have heard of, which can become a problem, can also be beneficial, but whatever Google is doing and Facebook are doing is also happening already to a large extent in the scholarly ecosystem. Um, then we have a section for tags. I think, well, we use, this is basically specific to the Kumo mapping, which we show you in a minute. Yeah, and then, yeah, so image is also for the mapping to show the logo and then API, ORCID, sign up. These are still empty columns, which would be nice to have also for each of them to make further analyses of each of the tools. But that, as you can imagine, is pure labor and we would like to crowdsource that rather to keep the workload um, manageable and also to add more tools uh, because this is obviously a selection of, um, as, as we said earlier, as we said, pointed out, it's a selection of tools that is dedicatedly or dedicated to open science practices and does not necessarily have to have, have to be, what is that English grammar? The, it is not necessary that the tool was designed specifically for that purpose, but is currently being used as serving open science kind of thing. So that was our selection process. Um, okay, coming back to the slides. So yeah, so that's the map. And then the next slide. Uh, okay, Luis, can you fill in again, like the attributes, elements and impact of the, just give two or three examples from this table. Um, uh, sure, so this links back to um, the list of uh, elements of the, the DOS that, that I presented in the previous slide. Um, so basically what we wanted to do was make transparent why we were looking at these different um, attributes. So um, how, for example, uh, what objectives um, were driving the tool creation, whether it was a business model, whether there had been investment, whether there was venture capital, whether it was grants, philanthropy, profit and community uh, activities. And then to, to link it to impacts on the open science ecosystem, because that could influence the um, design decisions um, of the DOS, and the longevity of the DOS post, um, say, uh, targeted investment or, or grants. Um, similarly, the host, the host organization, the host country could impact on the requirements and expectations of the host, uh, the political constituencies of the host countries and interruption through economic sanctions, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, so this table is really trying to link um, the attributes of the DOS um, and their specific granularities to um, what we identified as potential impacts for the open science ecosystem. Cool, thanks. Um, so then going from here, I think I did press, okay. Um, so this is now uh, several snapshots of what the actual map looks like. Um, I thought we could just show this in detail later, but for an interest of time, let me just quickly show you a live demo now. Um, so here's Kumo, which is a corporate, yes, but um, you can use it for free as long as your data set is also free to um, ex like open access um, to a large extent to make sense of complex data sets. So now these, um, this is the default, no, these are digital tools sorted by workflow step. And if, as you zoom in, you, well, no, that's not here, sorry. Um, so this is sorted by region. No, why is that? You know, was oh. Um, let me just quickly reshuffle. Okay, now we're losing time. But basically, I can we, like uh, in the meantime also share the link to this map so you can play around yourselves um, in the chat. Okay, it's taking forever. Let's come back to that and look at the. Stills. 
So the first one is the, um, the clustering by workflow step by discovery, architecture assessment, analysis, and publication writing. And you see there's a few outliers which basically address, um, so one tool addressing more than one of the workflow steps. And there's also um, um, tools that cover not all, but many of the workflow steps. Um, and like figure, um, and yeah, and figure to be, um, there's a clustering by countries you see is very US heavy. So most tools have been developed in a US context or being hosted by United States um, research or yeah, other kinds of institutions. Um, there's a lot also in the, uh, in the UK and other, well, European Union now, sadly that is not, not the same anymore, but other European countries. Um, in image C, you see, what was it? Um, clustering by host institution for the tool. So you see here, there's also, I think that was GitHub, like which, which um, surrounds most of the tools to it. Yeah, and that, um, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, and the last one is just an example of what that look looks like, of, like a zoom of, um, and there's no guitar, um, a zoom of um, this, yeah, this, uh, what is it? Image C, sorry, it's also uh, towards the end of a long day. <laughs> That's another one. So um, another analytical or outcome was um, plotting in a, what's the word? Yeah, plotting by countries as we already saw in the map. So this is now what it looks like in a bar diagram. So United States has out of these 242, uh, um, basically hosts 135. And then UK, there's two that are co-hosted by both countries. Um, yeah, so you get the gist. And that's basically just an impressive way, or, you know, it just visualizes what we already knew, but then also raises awareness and possibly concerns about how the tools can be accessed or not. Um, <clears throat> and this is looking at um, the, the underlying funding mechanisms. So for a few um, of again, 242, 0.4% are unspecified. So there we couldn't identify the funding source. We also didn't make the extra effort of reaching out to um, the service providers, um, which can probably be done or also probably possibly crowdsourced or we can work with some of the um, umbrella organizations to get more data to, the, to this image. Many are commercial, most have a mixed um, funding um, approach, which makes a lot of sense for sustainability purposes. Um, many are grant-based and then 44, like a good, um, well, more than, yeah, what is it, one-fifth, uh, have institutional funding only, which makes them dependent of their host institution, which can be a good thing or not um, for equity and access and inclusiveness by their community and users from across the world. The last diagram now shows, um, or is, a, is looking at individual service providers and organizations. So you see GitHub ha, basically covers the whole research workflow um, with several tools in it. And that means like GitHub is the underlying infrastructure for many tools. Um, so not GitHub themselves are operating the tools, but they're providing infrastructure for them. Um, Center for Open Science is in is both host and designer of tools that serve four workflow steps. Digital Science, um, Elsevier has a few, five um, Wikimedia. Um, our research, Science Open Public Knowledge Project. So this basically is also here to show us that we have a choice of organizations that we decide to trust our data with. And we can also, depending on who we, we want to work with or who are we actively collaborating with as researchers and also thinking beyond that horizon, like who do, who do we want to enable access to our data and our content? So these are things that we wanted to discuss with you. 
Um, but then, of course, there's all these individual tools um, that are in the hundreds and several hundreds, if not thousands, by now. Um, I think the 101 Innovations Project is now in the 800s or so of tools, but, but they are not explicitly for open science purposes. Um, okay, these are two examples of the terms and conditions where the tool provider, in this case, GitHub and Center for Open Science, by and they're in, in both cases, I, I guess, forced by their national legislature to define the terms and conditions in a certain way. Do you want to take that up again, Lou? Um, sure. So as Joe said, uh, very few people actually read the terms and conditions um, for any uh, DOS that they use. And it's quite surprising sometimes to recognize that many of the, well, a number of the DOS that we, we looked at had explicit prohibitions um, built into their terms and conditions. Uh, so for example, GitHub um, is directly prohibiting um, users from countries that are uh, affected, what well, are under uh, US sanctions. So Crimea, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, and Syria. Um, these uh, have reported blocking of um, access to GitHub. And there's been anecdotal evidence on Twitter and so forth about that. And from the previous slide, you can see that this doesn't only affect users who want to use GitHub, but it affects their ability to use a, not, a range of other open science tools, and thus um, really affects their ability to engage with the open science ecosystem. Uh, similarly, the Center for Open Science is also based in the US, and they also have um, explicit T's and C's prohibiting use in certain countries. As far as I know, they do not um, explicitly geoblock in these countries, but nonetheless, because their T's and C's make it very clear that they're not supporting users from these countries, it places a liability onto the users rather than onto the, the Center for Open Science for um, potential breaches um, through US legislation. And it's really interesting with the terms and conditions that these link, these prohibitions link back to the funding models uh, that are underlying these, um, these dots. So GitHub, for example, is a commercial company um, based in the US. And because it's based in the US it's, and is a commercial company, it's subject to US um, financial legislation uh, and therefore is not allowed to transact with countries um, to which the US um, is currently holding sanctions. And the Center for Open Science is a 501c3 uh, company, which is an NPO, but it also is audited um, and therefore su subject to US um, financial legislation. So you can see that by unpacking these different layers of um, design decisions and design elements within the DOS, uh, you can come up to uh, come up against a whole lot of different issues that are impacting their ability to actually fulfill the role for which they were intended or which they're assumed to play uh, within the open science landscape, that they're not necessarily unlimited and uh, they do not necessarily have unlimited openness and do not necessarily um, allow users from around the world to be able to engage in open science activities. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Uh, thanks again. Thanks. Thanks. Do you want to? Yeah, it up? sure. So, um, as I was saying, um, what we've seen from our analysis, um, which is a, as Joe said, an ongoing analysis, and we're hoping to add to it, is that there are definitely unlevel un unequal levels of openness within the open science ecosystem that are linked directly to the design um, of the DOS within this ecosystem. And what we'd like to highlight is um, some issues that uh, we feel are arising out of the uncritical um, adoption of these tools into the ecosystem, that they cause power dynamics to be perpetuated, which can lead to the marginalization of certain user groups. And what we've seen from uh, the funding analysis is that uh, governments and commercial companies can have undue influence on the landscape due to their hosting, financing, and other influential roles. And that the existing DOS ecosystem, because it's evolving so rapidly, um, can become prescriptive of a specific way of doing as one tool becomes hyper-dominant. And these are very interesting questions to be asking about the open science ecosystem, and very important when we're thinking of open science as uh, a way of engaging um, researchers and populations around the world without any sort of barriers, uh, which obviously is the underlying um, intention of open science. Uh, next slide, please. And this leads um, 
to what Joe and I have been uh, trying to develop is a critique of the notion of the digital commons. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the idea of the digital commons as a way of framing the open science uh, landscape as um, uh, a landscape of unlimited resources where user communities around the world can use um, these digital resources without diminishing them at all. And that really has become a driving um, motivation behind uh, governments and companies and researchers investing and supporting open science activities. But what we're seeing through our study and uh, the related studies that we've highlighted is that the heterogeneity of actors, power dynamics and stakeholders that are currently driving and dominating the evolution of the DOS ecosystem can be very problematic. And this makes it um, impossible for us to simply assume that the resulting ecosystem will automatically reflect and perpetuate the core values of open science. And particularly what our analysis is highlighting is that the range of different factors inherent within the DOS design create a landscape that can be seen to perpetuate marginalization and exclusion, particularly to researchers in countries um, that are currently under sanctions and uh, to researchers who do not necessarily have access to certain uh, tools. And we feel this really under, undermines the ideal of the digital commons um, as a way of providing unlimited access to share resources. And we'd be really interested to hear um, what people have to say about that and whether um, this is something that we feel needs to be taken more seriously, but whether um, everyone on this call and, and further on uh, think that this needs to become a topic of conversation. So I think that was our last slide actually. Yeah. So thanks so much. Um, Oh, it wasn't our last slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I agree. Like I think we can leave it here. We can keep this open for people yeah. to reflect on and and yeah, open for Q and A and discussion and input and questions. Well, that's me. Really nice. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so very much for that. I really appreciate it. It's super interesting and uh, yeah, I can't wait to actually get a hold of that data set and have a look at it. So uh, maybe you can share with us um, the data set once it's uh, available and uh, how can people explore it further or go on with it, um, examining yeah. it. Yeah, we can. Also, we are also very happy to discuss like the, yeah. I mean, I think we, we can already, but it is available on the model already as a downloadable a spreadsheet, Excel sheet, um, as CC BY. We also wanted to make it available as CC0 for anyone to use for their own purposes without having to cite us. But for that, we wanted to also make, slim it a little bit down because a lot of work went into it, which for which we would like to also stay in collaboration with or to, to kind of stand, have a chance of being in touch with people who reuse the data set. But again, like a CC0 version will also be made available. And we would like to use this opportunity to discuss with you what a minimal viable product, which is so informative enough, would look like to, to let this kind of fly on its own and also allow us to build on a more ex extensive list as a community. What do you see? What do we need? So, um, I think that's I'm a gonna... important point that Joe raises that We've started this data set, but it's by no means complete. And um, because the landscape is evolving so rapidly, um, it will become out of date quite quickly. So we'd really like this tran to transition from um, a project that Joe and I have been doing into something that the community can use and update and really find value for. Because what we're anticipating is that we're envisioning is that people could use this map to make strategic decisions about um, the DOS that they use to make sure that all aspects of their workflow are as open as possible and as inclusive as possible. <laughs>